Welcome everybody. Welcome. Okay. Sorry, what? We'll just keep those another minute or so. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Thank you to my extended family for this special privilege and opportunity. And welcome everybody. I guess we'll begin in a moment, right? Yeah. Perfect. You can hear me and see me. Everything good? Everything's perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to share a document in the middle. That's fine, right? Absolutely. Huh? Absolutely, sure. Okay. Are you making me a host so I could read people's chats? Yes. Uh, yeah. While you're around, I'll make you a host. Okay. So I should be able to Can see people. Because I don't see ability to chat. You want to give people the ability to chat so we can get questions. Welcome everybody on the yeshiva.net, whoever is here. We're going to start in a few moments. It's a Zoom event as well for single parents, especially single moms, so we're waiting for everybody to come on. Reb Levy, yeah. you'll give people the ability to chat? Um, yes. So they can ask questions if they wish. Say then. I am ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Lady Muller. I'd like to welcome you all to this evening of discussion on single parenting. The topic for tonight is navigating a single parent life. This event is being hosted by my extended family. I want to thank everyone who put this together and all of you for joining us this evening. I want to take a moment to speak very briefly about my experience. 
and family. The organization is I'm so grateful to be any part of. My Center Family is a first of its kind organization offering support services geared directly towards serving children from single parent homes and ever growing population. My Center Family currently provides after school programming for children from single parent homes at our home homework club. We pair every child, each child has a um, volunteer big brother or a big sister, and each child is made to feel important and special. Additionally, we have fun activities, trips, and other events throughout the year. It is our view that parents are heroes and single parents are superheroes. We appreciate the single parents who partner with us in becoming part of the family and giving us the incredible opportunity to work with their children. Our objective is twofold. First, to reach children from single parent homes and give them the joy and guidance and stability they deserve. And secondly, to bring children from single parent homes together under one roof and truly create an extended family so they can be there and grow to support one another. We service families from diverse walks of life who currently have full service branches at Crawford, Mentee, Crossroads, and Stone Hill. So if you're not yet a member and you believe you and your child can benefit, please look us up online at www.myf.org for more information on how to get involved. We're also looking to expand to other communities, so feel free to contact us through the website if you'd like to partner with us and join the family. We have several parenting workshops coming up, so stay tuned. The lookout for those announcements. Rabbi Wai Wai is an important part of our work, and we're honored to have him back again to do another event with us. So Rabbi Wai Wai needs no introduction, so without further ado, please take it away. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Just give me a thumbs up. You could see me, hear me. Perfectly. Okay, wonderful. First of all, Thank you, Reb Levy. Thank you, Mrs. Marcus. Thank you to the entire staff and dedicated leadership of my extended family and all of its branches, including here in uh, our little shtetl here in Rockland County. And welcome to everybody who's joining us. I just want to clarify, this is for all single parents or single moms? Single parents. Single parents. Okay. So, just about the structure of this evening. I received already by email many questions from many of the single parents who are attending this evening. So, I'm going to be speaking for a few minutes, and then afterwards we're going to open the floor to questions. I have already many questions that were sent in, so I'm going to address those questions. But feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question right here. Or, if you wish, you can chat your question. Is the chat room open? Yeah, I think we're working on Okay. And uh, since I'm a host, you can write your chat anonymously. So nobody, I won't know or nobody has to know who you are. You could write your name, but I won't say any names, so it's fine. And you can uh, feel free to ask any question you would like. So I'm going to speak now for a few minutes, approximately 20 minutes, and then we're going to open the floor to uh, to questions and conversations. You can bring up any topic you want. Again, I already have, I think, between 10 or 20 questions, maybe more, but you can uh, continue to ask live questions. I want to thank very much every single one of you for gracing us this evening and being here with us for this important event. And of course, the incredible work of my extended family throughout the entire year to be there for uh, the heroes and uh, heroines who uh, are uh, so dedicated and often face challenges that are profound, that are difficult, that are not easy to navigate. And uh, the fact that we can be here for each other, strengthen each other, give chizuk to each other, and just be present and show up in each other's life is extremely meaningful. So thank you all for being here. And I thank you for the privilege of being here this evening to address, navigate, navigating the single parent life, uh, really allowing ourselves to find more motivation during 
these trying times when uh, so many of us are feeling so isolated, especially when we're dealing with a single parent situation. What I am going to do in my opening remarks before we start with questions is just put out there two insights, two insights that I find to be very meaningful. We just began the month of Adr. The Gemara says in Meseches Tainus, the end of Meseches Tainus, the Chavtes 29, Adr, Marben Besimcha. We all know this. Mishen, 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 Nichnas Adar. When the month of Adr comes in, we increase in our joy. And the emphasis is we increase in our joy. Reb Tzadik HaKayin of Leblin says, because joy is the default mode of a Jew all year. I know there are people who extol sadness and melancholy, but if there was Hashem Simcha, the default mode of a Jew ought to be Simcha, joy. Now, it's not always easy. Sometimes it's very difficult to experience Simcha. It takes work to be happy, <laughs> right? But it's happy work because it's work that brings you to happiness. That's why it says by other, we increase in joy. It's not that now suddenly it's a joyous month. If you work on joy all year, in other, there's Marbim Basimcha. There's an extra dosage, an extra energy in the world that allows us to find deeper meaning, deeper serenity, deeper Simcha in our life. The Moir Enayim, Moir Enayim is a great work, a Hasidic work written by Reb Nachum of Chernobyl. He was a student of the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid. He writes, and this is also in the works of the Chidush Harim, the first Gerer Rebbe, Rebbe Shemer Alter, and the Svasemes. They say, Mishenichnas Adar, Adar, Adar is a combination of two words. Aleph, Dar. Aleph means one. Dar is, he lives, he dwells. Mishenichnas Adar. When Adar comes into our life, then Marbim Besimcha, then we can increase in joy. In other words, the moment I can realize that I'm with Adar, Aleph, Aleph is Hashem, the one, Hashem Echad, Aleph stands for Echad. Aleph is also one, Hashem is oneness. When I realize that Aleph, Hashem is Dar, is living with me in my home, in my Dira, Dar is like a Dira, dwelling place. Hashem is living with me, in me, in my heart, accompanying me, at every, in every journey, holding my hand to navigate every encounter, every experience, every morning and every evening, every day and every night. He is living with me and inside of me and inside each of my children. Then Then a person can experience so much more joy and tranquility and purpose and meaning, even during challenging and difficult and sometimes unfathomably sometimes unfathomable situations that don't make a lot of sense. That's number one. Number two, and here I want to share with you a page. I'm going to share with you a page because I want, to, I want you to see it inside. For me, it was very meaningful. You guys could see it? Okay, is it large enough? Yeah, it is. Okay. Tadarabah. This page, I just want to make sure I could see it. <laughs> okay, I'm just opening it up by me so I can have it. It's not showing up by me, so I want to make sure that I could see. It. 
Okay. So you see this page is Baruch Hashem Svas Emes Purim Tafrish Lamed Zion. This is a piece from the Svas Emes, the Holy Svas Emes, whose name was Rabbi Yehuda Aryeleib Alter. He was the second Rebbe of Gary, passed away in 1905. And in, uh, in a piece on Purim from Tafrish Lamed Zion, Tafrish Lamed Zion would be 1877, a couple of years ago. He has an incredible piece about a little detail in the Megillah that's very often to miss. It's very easy to miss. Okay. Take a look inside. I want to read it with you inside. Let's remember the context of the story. Esther was taken as a queen for the Persian king Ahasuerus. He executed his wife Vashti. He needed a new queen. They had this whole context and this whole system of Ahasuerus scrutinizing various women who were brought from the Persian Empire. And finally, Ahasuerus chooses Esther, he really appreciates her, he takes a liking towards her. And the Megillah, this is in chapter 3, this is in chapter 2 of Megillah's Esther. It says, Ubechol yoim v'yoim, and this is what he's quoting, Ubechol yoim v'yoim, Mordechai mishalich lifnei chatzar beis ha-melech, lifnei chatzar beis ha-noshem, ladaz eshleim Esther umayi asabah. Every single day, it doesn't say Bechol yoim, it says Bechol yoim v'yoim, Every day and day, which means every single day without exception, Mardachai would walk, he would stroll before the courtyard where the women were staying, the women who were part of this test, contest, in order to know the welfare of Esther and what is happening with her. And the Megillah continues to describe how Achashvedish, you know, was scrutinizing the various women until finally. In the seventh year of his reign, he chose Esther as his queen. He loved her more than everybody else. He made this big party. That is the story in chapter 2 of Megillus Esther. Okay. Now, we all know, you all remember this from school, or from yeshiva, or from Beis Yaakov, wherever you study. There's a concept called Gzeir Shava, which means whenever there are similar words that are used, in different instances, we assume that this is a divine copy-paste situation. In other words, the two instances are connected, especially if it's in the same book. Where else does it say in the Megillah, Bechal Yoim V'yoim? It says here, Mardechai, or Bechal Yoim V'yoim Mardechai Meshalach. Is there anywhere else we have in the Megillah this expression, Yoim V'yoim, day in, day out, as we would say in English, day after day. One more time we have it in the Megillah. One more time. We're right in the next chapter. Ahasuerus appoints Haman as his viceroy, as his prime minister. And everybody is prostrating themselves to Haman, of course, with the exception of Mardachai. And the servants of the king tell Mardachai, why do you transgress the commandment of the king to honor Haman, to bow down to him? And the Megillah continues, Vayhi ka'amra my love, or Vayhi ba'amra my love, Yoim yoim v'leisham aleihem. They told this to him every single day. Day after day they told him, Why are you violating the commandment of the king? But Mardukhai would not heed them. What is the connection between these two yoim yoims? The only two times you have yoim v'yoim in the Megillah. Okay, this is the context behind this Fasemis. But there's another question. And the more basic question maybe is, why is this relevant to the story? That Mardukhai came every single day strolling around the courtyard to find out what's happening. What is that about? Like, it's it's interesting story. But ev- the Megillah doesn't tell me everything that happened in the Persian Empire during that time. I don't know when Vashti became a queen. I don't even know when Achashverosh became a king. I don't know who Haman was before. We have about this in the Gemara and the Midrashim. The Megillah includes all of the details that are somehow relevant to the narrative. 
all the details that are somehow relevant, uh, either to understand the story, to understand who Achashverosh was, to understand who Haman was, to understand who Esther was, to understand who Mordechai was, to understand how things were happening in the Persian Empire, to understand the nature of the king, the nature of the government, the nature of the relationship between the king and the subjects, the nature of the decree, understanding the vibe, the ambiance, the zeitgeist, the milieu. These are all relevant to the Purim story. There's not a detail in the Megillah that's not relevant. Ask the Sfasemis, why is this relevant? Mordechai was a nice man, yeah, okay. Why is it relevant that every single day he walked there in order to find out how Esther was? That's not really part of the story. It is relevant that Esther was taken. It is relevant that Esther was part of a large group of women who were taken. It is relevant that Achashverosh really liked her and he chose her as his queen. I mean, that's, those are essential parts of the story. It is relevant that Achashverosh did not know she's Jewish because he did not tell her that she, she did not tell him that he's Jewish. Why is it relevant that every single day Mardukhai was taking a walk in front of the courtyard where the women were staying in order to find out what is happening with Esther. Is that an essential part of the Megillah? How does that add or contribute to the story in any way? Listen to the incredible explanation of the Sfasemes. Zok the Sfasemes, take a look inside. Nira, it seems to me, Shekal hadvarim haneskarim b'megillah haya hakoy hanes. Every detail, every part of the narrative that's mentioned in the Megillah was all an integral part of the miracle. Somehow, these were all moving pieces that contributed and become part of this larger story, this larger mosaic, known as the miracle of Purim. Why this detail? Because this is certainly a tremendous thing. It was four or five years from when Esther was taken to Hashverosh, and Mordechai went every single day to see how she was, because she was an orphan. And because, of he knew, because he knew of her distress, of being abducted and being in the home of somebody who was completely alien to her, a non-Jewish monarch, and because of this, Mardachai merited that through him, the miracle of Purim happened. Do you get what his Mephasemus is saying? This <laughs> is such a beautiful insight. When was Esther taken to the palace? Esther was taken to the palace in the sixth year of Achashverosh's reign because she becomes his queen in the seventh year. It says the seventh year of his reign, she becomes his queen. When does the decree against the Jewish people come out? In the 12th year of his reign. This means, till the Haman's decree, she was his queen for five years. She was already there before, because there was a whole system. She was already there before because there was an entire system. So it may even be uh, seven years, it may be usually six years. But the Svassama says it's around four or five years from when Esther is taken to Achashverosh until everybody finds out she's a Jew and Mordechai is her relative and he becomes the prime minister instead of Haman. And Mordechai is walking and going there every single day to see how she is. Not for a year, not for two years, not for three years, not for four years, but for five full years or maybe more. Mordechai does not miss a single day. And it says, Bechol Yom V'yom. Bechol Yom V'yom means, not most days, every day, every day. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbos. Now, I can understand the first week, Mordechai came every day. The second week, the first month. But at some point, she's the most powerful woman in the empire. She is the queen of Achashverosh. Achashverosh was the mighty Persian monarch. He ruled much of the civilized world and most of it. Marshal the keeper. She's the queen. She's secure. Nobody's harming her. This is even before Haman's decree. She's fine. I mean, she was abducted. She was taken. She's good. Why do you have to go every day, Sunday through Shabbos? It's not like Mardachai was a retired old man who didn't have what to do. Mardachai was the leader of the Sanhedrin. He was considered the spiritual leader of the Jewish people at the time. In other words, Mardechai had Kalal Yisrael on his shoulders. 
to put it mildly, he was quite busy, he was quite occupied. He was considered the greatest sage of his time, the greatest leader of his time. So Mordechai had a lot on his plate. Yet every single day he found time. Bechol yoyim v'yoyim. Without exception. For years. To go find out how Esther is doing. Why? Says this Fasem is because she was an orphan. And he knew that she was abducted. She did not go there voluntarily. The king loved her. The king treated her well. The king was crazy about her. The king cherished her. But there was a pain in her. There was a void in her. She did not have parents. He raised her as a parent because she had no parents. And now she was taken. Mordechai didn't only feel responsible. He felt deeply connected. His empathy knew no bounds. And therefore the least he can do is to show up every day and tell Esther, I'm here for you. I'm thinking about you. I will never forget you. He's the head of the Sanhedrin. He's the spiritual leader of the Jewish people. Send the shliach. Send the shliach. Many people would be happy. They can go to the palace, yeah? They go into the Persian White House. You know, guys love God. Have the love going to the White House. <laughs> and if you especially you get a security passing, you can go fast. I'm a chaya. There's a lot of guys. They can even do a photo up with Achashverish, with Esther, with the other Chev, send it out to their WhatsApp groups, put it on their Instagram profile, whatever their profiles. I'm a chaya. Felt us. Mordechai was missing Hevre that he could send from the yeshiva, from the Beis Medrash, from the shul, from the koil to go there. Or Stam Yidin. There would have been plenty of shluchim, a lot of loyal in Yisrael. Send the shliach. The shliach will do the job. You want to send her some challah for Shabbos? Send some challah for Shabbos. A bissel fish, a little sushi, some Persian food for Shabbos. Sheyye? No, he goes himself. U bechol yoim v'yoim Mordechai mishalach. Says the Svasemes, you want to know something? This is why he merited that the miracle happened through him. That's why it's relevant to the story. This, because of Mordechai's connection, because of Mordechai's caring, because of Mordechai's empathy, that's why the miracle happened through him. Svasemes says, now you'll understand the yoim yoim. Uksiv gamken ba'amro may love yoim v'yoim. Where's the next yoim v'yoim? They told Mordechai every day, day in, day out, they told him, Why are you violating the commandment of the king? Why aren't you bowing down to Haman? Day in, day out, day after day, they told this to him and he did not heed them. He did not listen to them. What's the connection? Because Mordechai was walking and taking a stroll and going every single day to visit Esther, that's why he merited to triumph over Haman Arasha and to provoke him every single day, to obliterate the pride, the ego, the hubris, the pompousness, the futile vanity of Yaman to win him again every day because he went every day to visit Esther to take care of that woman. Therefore, he merited that every single day, Yom Vayan, he managed to defeat Russia, to, to, to defeat Haman, to bring down the clipper, to crush the Amalek of his generation, the Agogi of his generation, and ultimately to defeat him completely. But yoyim v'yoyim, it's a special schuz that every single day he can bring down Haman. He can somewhat destroy Haman. And we see how Haman went crazy from this daily ritual of Mardukai that he would not bow down. Those are the two yoyim yoyims. Wow, what a powerful lesson. According to the Sfasemes, the whole Megillah could be summed up in that one Pasuk. You know, we think about Mardukai, we think about Esther, Mardukai, this great leader. Sfasemes so says, you know what's really the greatness of Mardukai? that he went to visit an orphan every day. And he knew that there was a Jewish girl trapped and he had to show up. Not because he could take her, he couldn't take her out, he couldn't emancipate her, he couldn't do anything about it. But he could just show up. He could just say, Esther, I'm here. Their eyes could connect. 
their hearts could connect. He can give Esther the gift of friendship, the gift of camaraderie, the gift of belonging, the attachment that she needed so profoundly. And he didn't do it six days a week. He did it seven days a week, which means he did it on Hanukkah, he did it on Purim, he did it on Pesach, Shavu, Sukkot, Lag Boim, Etu Bishvat, Metzoyim, Kippah, Erev Yom Kippah, every day, Bechal Yom Viyay, no exception. This was his M.O. And because of this connection, that's why miracle happened. That's why the miracle of saving the whole Jewish people happened through him. Because if you can't, if you don't really care about one, you don't care about 12 million. Klal Yisrael is made up of Reb Yisrael's, of individuals. And that speaks to us so deeply, you know. Every one of us here this evening is going through their own challenges. In many ways, you often feel trapped. You feel trapped by life. You feel trapped by your circumstances. You feel trapped in a relationship that doesn't even exist. And you know what, very well what I'm talking about. You feel trapped by a relationship that doesn't even exist. Sometimes you look at your children and you feel that they're orphans. Maybe not biologically, but emotionally. And this is what the Sfasamas teaches us, what we can learn from Mardukhai. I can't always change the circumstances or change the situation. But I could just show up. I could show up for myself. I could show up for my children. I could show up for you. I can show up for others. And that's our calling. We don't always have the magic pill or remedy to transform the situation. Sometimes we could transform situations, and we should. Everybody should do whatever they can to make their lives as best as possible on every level, physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, socially. But our greatest power is that wherever we are, we have the other. We can experience the visit of Mardechai, or in this case, Mishanichnas other that Hashem is with me. I'm not alone. And to be able to give that gift to other people. When we can give that gift to other people, miracles happen through us. And that's what all of Purim is about, according to this interpretation of the Svasamas. So I say to you that tonight we have questions and we have doubts and we have concerns and we have worries. And there's so many things we can't figure out and we wonder about. The most important thing is, let us show up for each other and let us show up for ourselves. And now I'm going to go to the questions. How do I close this page, Mrs. Marcus? You have to help me. I don't know why when I opened when I opened the page the bottom disappeared from my screen and I don't know why. Can you do it for me or you can't? I don't know, tell me, is the page off? Beautiful. Okay, let's go to questions. The chat room opened. We could not open the chat room. But we have questions, and if more come in, there's a link to submit questions. So how do you have questions if this chat room is not open? Well, well the questions that we sent earlier. Oh, that I have. Okay, so I'll start with those.
Okay, let me begin. Also, there's people joining us on theyeshiva.net, the first video on top, navigating the single parent life. So over there you can also put in questions if you wish. I see there's quite a lot of people on the website, so they can also put in questions there. Fine. Let's go to the first question. I'm just going to the pages of questions. Okay. I'm just going to excuse myself for 30 seconds. I'm going to be right back and we'll begin with the questions. I'm sorry. Sorry, Hevda. Okay. There's around six or seven questions that came in. Actually, there's around 20 questions that came in that more or less have the same theme. So I'm going to read these questions once, and then I'm going to address it, because even though there's variations, but more or less they're addressing the same theme. I have a son, he's a special needs kid. He hasn't seen his father since the pandemic started. Every time I text my ex that our son wants to see him and go for Shabbos, my ex either ignores the message or uses Corona as an excuse not to see him. How do I explain to my younger child why his father won't take him for Shabbos again without making his father look bad? He's healthy. COVID-19 hasn't affected him, but he will not see his child. Or, another one, how do I go about celebrating my child's bar mitzvah or my daughter's bat mitzvah during this time when one parent doesn't acknowledge the prime, the prime caregiver as the other parent? Using corona as a good excuse to exclude the other parent from participating in the simcha. How can I celebrate my child's bar mitzvah during such a time? Another one. My son's father is not making an effort to see the children. His visits were sporadic since he moved away. But when the court ordered supervised visitations, due to his unpredictable behavior, he's seeing them even less. The court did not restrict his visitation as providing the supervisor, only if he asks for it. My children were happy with this arrangement. They were able to spend time with their father and feel safe at the same time. It's now a year since their father came to visit. My son feels abandoned. They take it personally that he doesn't want to see them and they feel hurt. One of my children asks me to arrange that his father comes, which is obviously beyond my control. Can you give chizuk to my son who is hurting? My ex-husband keeps on putting my children in the middle. 
undermining my authority to my children. There's nothing I can do to change him. It just makes for an impossible situation, more impossible. Whatever support and advice I can get, keep me afloat. How am I supposed to support my young children, ages 7 to 3, when their father is constantly in and out of their lives? He will go from showing up every day for a visit to disappearing for months with no explanation. How can I explain it to my children without talking negatively about him? I want to validate their feelings, but I also want to help them accept the reality of this being all that I can offer them. Unfortunately, I'm looking forward to hear the answer. First of all, I am very, very sorry to hear this. There were many other questions of similar genre, similar ideas, similar concepts, similar experiences and emotions. I just batch, I just put together, I compiled together many questions that I think fit into the same category. I want to add one more question that I see came in now. How do I move forward? I was in a domestic, abusive home, a violent relationship. There was also drug and alcohol abuse in the life of my ex-spouse. How am I supposed to move forward from this? I was married for many years. Was it all a waste and the biggest mistake of my life? How am I supposed to deal with it? How do I help my kid who is an only child and is feeling all alone? I'm a single parent of one child, age eight. I am our sole provider financially. The ex is not in the picture. I am not only mom and dad. I am his playmate. I'm his teacher. But my job also became more demanding during these times, even though I'm working from home. It's just the two of us, 24-7, and it's getting harder and harder. Okay, you get the picture. <laughs> so, I want to, I want to make, a, I want to make a few points. The first thing is, and this is obvious. This is obvious. You don't need me to tell this to you. Is I just have to make this disclaimer. I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a coach, I'm not a family therapist, I'm not a child therapist. I have no training and I have no degree. So this is extremely important for me to say at the onset. I am not giving here any authoritative guidance and advice about how to deal with these situations. I am talking as a friend to friends, as a brother to brothers and a brother to sisters. I have to say this to you knowing that every situation is unique and individual and and number one and number two it's obviously always advisable to have in our lives real professionals real experts who can help us navigate these types of dilemmas help us process our emotions help our children through their struggles and i know my extended family tries to help in this area as well and I'm just going to say about this, some therapists are amazing, some of them are not amazing. If you go to somebody and he's not helping you or she's not helping you, don't feel bad to move on. You know, not every shidduch works. Just because I'm dating somebody, they may be a wonderful person, but it's not for me. You move on. You know, if after one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, there's no new awareness, there's no benefit, there's no growth... Uh, there's no change, nothing. It may not be for you. Don't, don't be timid. Don't be afraid. That's just important. Um, it's important to be humble. It's important to get advice. But it's also important to be an educated consumer and to make sure it's working for you. And not just become a zombie and follow people blindly, even during times when your instincts and your heart and, and mama knows best when your soul says, no, this is not the right thing. And it has to be working for you. After making all these very important disclaimers, let me share, let me share a few thoughts. You know, before we ask the question what to tell our children, we first have to ask the question what do we tell ourselves? What happened in my life? How did this marriage become so miserable? 
Why did I marry him? Or why did I marry her? Again, I don't know who exactly I'm speaking to. What happened? What is happening? Our brains like to make sense out of life. We like puzzles. We want things to be logical. But there's a challenge here. And that is, a lot of this does not make sense. And I think when we try very hard to make sense out of our lives and to have it fit constructs and models, it often becomes a trap that doesn't allow us to really live in the moment and to be, to be able to tune in to our calling and our shlichus and our destiny at this moment. We love logic. We like that things should make sense. We're, we desperately long for it. But it's a trap. Because this is not a logical situation. There's not a situation that makes sense. The situation would have made sense. It probably would have never happened. We have to embrace a reality that is often not logical, that does not make sense. We have to be able to say that there are questions that remain questions, and I have no answer for them. And I have to be able to embrace that reality and to stay in that moment. And only when I could do that with myself can I do it with my child. So you ask, what should I tell my child? Your child looks you in your eyes and says, Mommy, why? Why is Tati not coming to visit? Why did Tati leave you? Why did you leave Tati? Why don't we have a normal family? Why can I be like Chaim? Why can I be like Yaakov? Why can I be like Mati? Mommy, why is Tati so angry always? Mommy, why does Tati never call? What happened to Tati? Can you really explain to your child things that you don't understand? And even if you think you do understand it, do you really understand it? Do you really know what's happening in the mind of your ex? Who understands it? Does he even understand himself? If he would have been more self-aware, probably his trajectory of his life would have been different. Can I really explain something to my child? Something that I don't understand, that I have no words? If I start explaining my child and giving answers and rationalizations and excuses, the child is going to take those words and he's going to try to make sense out of them because he also wants to make sense or she's going to try to make sense out of them. And probably they're also not going to be able to make sense which is going to leave them disappointed and lost and forever frustrated. But maybe the most important thing here is not the words, but the experience. Maybe not the explanations. Maybe my child doesn't need words. Maybe I just have to be able to really allow for the question and to be present with him and with her in the pain of the question. When my child says, does Tati love me? How can a Tati behave this way? Can I just allow my child to feel that I am here with her in this question? I am not running away. I am not giving fake answers. There's not going to be any fake news here. I'm not going to hurt my eyes. But maybe a flood of tears will come from my eyes. And I will teach my child that we can experience pain together because we are powerful enough to be able to endure the pain. We're not weak. We don't have to substitute the pain. We don't have to numb it. We don't have to run away from it. We don't have to cover things up. We don't have to rationalize things. We don't have to make believe it's not a big deal. We don't have to lie. We don't have to make up stories. We can experience the mystery. We can experience the questions. We can experience the pain without the need to camouflage anything, and I am here with you. I don't have answers just like you don't have answers. And I know that sometimes in life there are no easy answers for things. What I do know is Hashem is with me, Hashem is with you. We will prevail. We have a mission to do. We are more powerful than anything else. We are God's ambassadors in this world, and therefore we're invincible and indestructible. We can choose our responses, our reactions, our attitudes. But this is not about words as much as it's about being here with your child in his or her experience. So what I'm telling my child 
through my eyes and through my heart and through my empathy is, I get you. I understand you. I may not know just like you don't know, but you're not alone in this mystery. And together, we are going to be strong containing this pain. I may not have an explanation, but I can hold his hand and I can tell him, this is a good question, my dear angel. And give him or her permission to experience it and to be there with them in the experience. Maybe this is more important than every explanation in the world. And it's also giving the child the permission to be able to feel the pain, to feel the question. The child should feel safe to express anger, to express grief, to express sadness, to cry, to sob, to express whatever he or she is going through. They can feel safe in these four cubits to say whatever they want, to feel whatever they want. There's a safe place for all of their questions. Of course, if I have something good to say and encouraging to say and intelligent to say, I should say it. But some of these experiences that you are describing don't have explanations. <laughs> so what am I going to say? The guy is a uh, whatever. What am I going to say? This is what I'm thinking. Next question. How do I deal with a situation the father is not from anymore? He does keep Shabbos, he does keep Kashrus, but he's not from. Should I ignore it? Should I bring it up for a discussion with the child? What should I do? Well, if he keeps Shabbos and he keeps kosher, so that's a big deal. You mean he's not from, I guess, in other areas or maybe not the standards that he had before or you had before? Listen, obviously it all depends on the age, but... I think to ignore it completely is probably unwise because the child is probably experiencing a lot of things in his or her brain. So it's probably good to have a conversation about it. And the conversation must be one on one level where you don't want to destroy his relationship with his father and denigrate his father and say negative or nasty things about his father because this is, this is your child's father. So it's just important, I think, more than anything else to listen how the child is processing it and how they're experiencing it and to remember that there's certain things you're not going to be able to protect this child from. This child's neshama is on a different journey. Just like we have people who were born, Hashem wanted them to be born in religious families, but there are others Hashem wanted to be born in secular families. It's called a tinik shenishba. And they grow up in very different realities and very different circumstances. This was Hashem's plan. And He wanted them to be able to discover Yiddishkeit from that place. When your child has a parent who's not religious, whatever level that is, sometimes completely not religious, your child is not going to have that regular education that your neighbor's child has or your sister's child has, where everyone in their life is absolutely from. Not everyone in your child's life is from. And your child is going to see that. And your child is going to have conversations with his or her father. And they're going to hear that perspective. So don't try to get angry or obliterate that or go into denial or get upset or jealous of other people. Embrace the fact that your child's neshama is being sent through this path. This is Hashem's plan. It's not a mistake. And therefore your soul's neshama needs this in order to be able to bring its unique light to the world. So don't be afraid of it. Embrace it and just make sure that your Yiddishkeit is celebrated with passion, with gusto. And make sure that you're deeply connected to that child. So when that child grows up and has to make decisions, it's very likely that they will choose Yiddishkeit and they're going to choose it. It's not going to be coerced on them. They're going to have to choose it, which means it's going to be internalized because they could have chosen something else. So you want your attachment to be very powerful and you want that their experience of Yiddishkeit in your presence should be one that is authentic, that is deep. It could become really, really internalized. This, it is sad. And you, there's grief here. There is grief. It's not what you planned when you got married. You planned 
to build a bias neman be a beautiful home with, filled with Torah, filled with mitzvahs, filled with Yerushalayim, and the plan changes. It's like Esther in the palace. It's not what she planned for. It's a different mission. It's a different shlichus. Anybody wants to unmute themselves? Okay. Let me finish here. How do I deal with an ex who has a lot of power in the community? Because he has a lot of money and nobody treats me like a person anymore. Everybody turned their back on me because my ex is the one who has all the power. All the power. First of all, I'm very sorry. It's a painful situation. And what I would say is that you have to surround yourself with those few people who are real and authentic. And you could have a little compassion on people who surrender to superficiality. I mean, imagine, I'm thinking if I was in a community and what we would worship is money more than justice or money more than human dignity. How pitiful. What a shallow, miserable life. So I really have compassion for them, but you need a good support system. You need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven friends, mentors, colleagues, relatives who appreciate you, who you appreciate, and and, and you bond with them. You need a strong relationship with God. You need a strong relationship with your soul. You need real people in your life. And the fact that many people in the community just worship Him because of the money, I feel uh, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's foolish and it's horrible, but I am sure that in the community there are some real people. I'm sure that there are some authentic people, and that's who you want to hang out with. And maybe you have to also look for a different community if this community is unbearable. But here I'm going to say something about communities. Whenever communities are defending and taking sides where it's completely uncalled for, they really have to evaluate what they're doing. Whenever communities don't stand up to bullies, to people who are being cruel to their spouses, to their children, to abusers, to molesters, to people who are not following uh, the paths of justice and ethics and morality and empathy, we have to stand up to them. This is the responsibility of rabbis and rebbitsons. Our first and foremost responsibility is not to teach. It's not to show people how brilliant we are and how much data we have. It's like Mardachai. It's to go to the courtyard where the women are to be there for the orphan. So for me, it's very difficult to understand when spiritual leaders do not stand up to bullies in every form and and, and, and any form. I'm not judging anybody. I don't know the situation. I don't know the details. I'm just giving a general comment about our responsibility. Teachers, principals, educators, rabbis, rebbitzins, mashpiyim, people with influence, financial and other influence, You have to be sensitive. You have to have compassion. And you have to stand up for justice. And just to hear one side of the story and right away denigrate somebody else is also not fair. It's extremely important. Very, very, very important. You know, sometimes there are men who refuse to give a divorce to their wife. You guys at least got a divorce. Some men refuse to give a divorce to their wife. Sometimes it's the other way around too. But it's mostly this way. The man refuses to give a get. When one discovers the brutality of this, the abuse of this, it's important that every member in the community stands up to these people. Can't let people get away with murder can use the halacha to fight God, to fight Torah, to fight Avis Yisrael. They use halacha to destroy everything that halacha stands for. The hypocrisy of it. It's, it's, it's nauseating. So communities, spiritual leaders have to know this and stand up to every type of bully without fear and without intimidation. But you, as an individual, you cannot get sucked in to other people's dysfunction and other people's toxicity. 
you have to be healthy. One of my boys went to my ex at the beginning of the pandemic. My ex coerced him into it, and since then my ex doesn't allow him to come back home. How do I cope with this tremendous longing to see my son and have him come home? That's tough. The question is, is there a peaceful way to negotiate this? Can maybe a friend of your ex or a relative of your ex get involved and, and talk to him normally that he should allow you to see your son? If not, can you discuss with a top expert, a lawyer, how to deal with this? This is a very difficult situation. And you need a very strong relationship with Hashem. You need, a, you need because this is very painful, very, very painful. You need a very strong relationship with God to, to keep you afloat. It's a tough one, very tough. How do I maintain my sanity? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you maintain your sanity by taking care of yourself. It's a mitzvah to take care of yourself. You should probably wake up in the morning a little earlier than your child or children and spend time doing things that will help you anchor yourself in yourself. Exercise, meditation, davening, learning. It's important to eat well. It's important to take care of your body, of your mind, and of your soul. Your children need a strong mother or a strong father. Your children need a mother who has energy, vigor, stamina. It is a big mitzvah to take care of yourself. You need to get the right amount of sleep. You need to get help. You need to nurture yourself, whatever it is. If it's hiking or massages or swimming or dancing or writing journals or learning. If there's a teacher that you love or an instructor that you love, get in touch with them or listen to them, or watch them on the internet. But allow yourself the important, vital, to allow yourself to get the vital oxygen, spiritual and emotional oxygen that you need. This is very important. You have to anchor yourself every day. That's number one. Number two, don't fight reality. See it as your shlichus. Mardechai told Esther, don't fight your reality. Mi yodeyem leis kazaisi gat lamalchus. God made you become the queen of Ahasuerus to save the Jewish people. Don't get frustrated with the reality and get angry at the world and at your mother-in-law and at everybody else because they put you into the situation. It's not going to help anybody. Awareness is important, but the most important thing is that awareness should help you say, okay, this is what God wants from me today. And if this is my mission, hineni, embrace it. A lot of it is in our head where we have different expectations of what our days are supposed to look like and what our families are supposed to look like and therefore we get so frustrated when it's not working out the way we want it to be working out. It's like Esther would be frustrated that she's not getting regular shidduchim proposals. Yeah, you're married to Hashverish. Nobody's giving you a shidduch proposal. You're not leaving the queen. But one day Esther finds out that she's the one who saves the Jewish people. We each have our mission in this world. I cannot, I cannot take your mission. You cannot take my mission. And when you're in a certain situation, have certain circumstances, you have to say, This is my mission. This is my journey. I'm going to say, and do it with gusto and oomph and conviction and unwavering clarity and dedication. Can I cry sometimes? You can cry. Esther cried. There's grief. There's grief. You can cry. Grief because situations are difficult. Sometimes our missions are difficult. Yosef was sent on a mission. He cried a lot, but he knew that he was sent. He wasn't sold, as we spoke many times. I hope this can help a little bit. I have a very intense 11-year-old daughter. She sometimes gets out of hand. She's very energetic. She bothers and hurts her siblings. Last Shabbos was so hard. I was not in control. I feel terrible about it. How do I handle myself when I feel I'm losing control from her actions? What can I do? And how do I handle my two daughters' rivalry towards each other? I'm not an expert, but you, I think you have to get lessons, maybe with a professional, of how to handle yourself in moments of very, very deep tension when you feel out of control. There's a lot of people now who are doing somatic therapy, which is basically work with the body that gives you the tools 
of allowing your consciousness to go from your amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. When tension is happening in the house and the kids are going crazy, I'm going crazy, I'm not human, I'm responding from my reptilian brain. I'm like a reptile. I'm responding from my nefesh of Bahamas. You want to be able to respond from your prefrontal cortex and there are tools. You know, breathing and feeling your body and feeling where the pain is and feeling your, your, your solid foundation on the ground and feeling where your seat is. These are some of the basic tools and there are more deeper, more intricate tools, but this is maybe you need some lessons in this to be able to do maybe somatic therapy or other forms of therapy to really help you be able to navigate these difficult moments. So I would speak to a professional about this and make sure it works. Don't, don't uh, as I told you, be, be an, informed, an informed consumer. My 15-year-old loves learning Gemara. He found a live shear in Israel at 1 a.m. in Israel. He gets some sleep. Then he goes to Davin, and then he sleeps the rest of the day because his class is 1 a.m. All his teachers call up, why is he not going on Zoom? How can I handle this? Well, the fact that he loves a class in Israel at 1 a.m., I mean, I like that. That's a good thing, and he's an interesting, must be an interesting child. So first of all, that may be very good. I don't know that it's so bad. But maybe he could sleep at night and watch the replay of the class. You know what I would really do? I would get in touch with the teacher of that class. You shouldn't know it's coming from you. And explain to him the situation in your house. And let that teacher reach out to your child. Maybe he can make a chavrusa with him. Maybe once a week for 10 minutes. Maybe you can even, if you have extra money, you could pay him a couple of dollars for it. I don't know the situation. But if he really likes that teacher, I would use that for the advantage of this teacher becoming an influence of the kid. So the bottom line is, first of all, maybe the schedule at the moment is not so bad if he's inspired. But two, maybe he could watch the replay. You know, Maybe he can even call once a week the teacher in Israel and ask him questions. I would try to work this out. Okay, next question. A lot of questions. You, told, you said that Esther was abducted. Didn't Mardechai force her to participate in the contest? Perhaps when Achashverosh picked Esther, Mardechai felt guilty for forcing Esther into the situation, and that's why he came to check on her? No, Mardechai didn't force her. It says that Esther was taken. Mardechai didn't force her. The king sent emissaries, and I guess to refuse them, you could get killed. So this was not Mardechai's fault. How should I respond when my five-year-old asks, why, doesn't mom, why don't mommy and Tati live together anymore? She still remembers the time when we did. There's probably family, marriage, marriage, divorce, family therapists who can answer that question from a lot of experience. I'm giving you a very unprofessional answer from what I think is basic common sense. And to really explain to your child that... Mommy is a good person. Abba is a good person. They have differences of opinion a lot of times. And it was hard to be together. You know, let's say you're with a child in the same room and you're always fighting. You always want, both want the same toy. And you're having arguments who should have it. And at some point you decide, you know what, you're going to buy two toys and play with it in different rooms. So maybe to explain, you know, I don't know again the situation and do you have a civil relationship or not, but to explain that mommy and Tati had different point of views and there were a lot of disagreements between us and we felt that even though we were once together and it was a good time, but it would be better for us and for the kinderlach if we're separated. And here I would just add how important it is, if at all possible, to be civil. And I know it takes two to tangle. But I cannot say this enough. I've told this to every couple that was contemplating divorce. It's painful. And inevitably we blame the other person. And sometimes we're right. 
but it's going to be much more painful if the dispute continues even after the divorce. And it's even more painful and horrifically abusive to use our children as missiles in our fight against our ex. So despite our pain, despite the aggravation, despite the law's dreams, don't use your children as missiles. And be civil. If you need a therapist to vent to, that's fine. But be civil. I beg of you. I know you think that she is X, Y, and Z. And I know you think he is X, Y, and Z. And he did this. And he cheated. And he, he's a, he was addicted. And you're right. <laughs> but I say to you, look at the big picture. And think about the long-term benefits for your child. He is your father's child. She is your He is your child's father. She is your child's mother. You may not like her. You may not like him. Maybe for good reason. But he is forever your child's father. And we need fathers. We need mothers. We need fathers. Don't take that away from them. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not judging you. I'm not blaming. I'm saying whenever you have two people, if there are two people here listening to me and you happen to be exes, do it civilly. You will not regret it. Everything, bar mitzvah plans, bat mitzvah plans, school plans, camp plans, financial agreements, visitations, Shabbos, Yom Tov, with respect, with covet, with normalcy. There's a fellow I know he was molested. He molested others. He became a terrible addict. He got married. He got divorced. He went into recovery. And he became an incredible Bal tshuva. Those Bal tshuva, the Gemara says that they're greater than Sadiqim. And after years... He sat down with his ex and he read her a letter apologizing for everything he did to her and everything he brought her through. They both sat on a park bench and sobbed for like 45 minutes. There was nothing to say. They were divorced. They had a few children together. He had so many challenges in life, and it didn't start with, his, with him at all. Things happened to him. I'm not going to get very graphic here. But when I heard it from him, I was also crying. It was a triumph of the human spirit. He could sit down and just say, I'm sorry. I have no excuses. I have no way of bringing, changing anything. I have no way of redoing this. And I have no way of compensating you for what I've done to you and the mess I brought you into. But all I can say is I'm sorry. And you know what happens? The Shechina gets revealed at those moments. Hashem dwells in places where there's no ego. And when the Shechina gets revealed, there's a lot of healing. The healing doesn't mean everything is perfect and beautiful and dandy. The healing means that I find the infinite divine courage to be present in my reality and bring the light into my darkness and move on from here and maximize the situation. I'm emotional when I say this story because it was such a powerful moment. Wow, very powerful moment. How do I deal with a difficult ex who constantly takes me to court for no appropriate reason, especially... When I am a loving and caring mom, I have a child for all the days of the week. I'm the primary caregiver. The unnecessary visits to court have become so tiresome and emotional drain. I even have a virtual court appearance on the day of Purim. I'm ready for it, but it stops me from moving forward in my life. And my ex constantly keeps me busy with his shenanigans. Wow. Shamirach, Hashem 
I would try to get a friend, a community member, a rabbi he respects to tell him, let us use an arbitrator that you trust, that I trust, to deal with our differences. It's so much cheaper. It's so much more balabatish. It's so much easier. Why do we have to do this? That's what I would try to do. I would try to use every means of influence to try to explain to him it's a waste of money, it's a waste of time. And it's so important, and I'm not going to speak again to the community, people who have influence on these people, people who have power in communities, should speak up. Should not let people get, in, get, get away with this, of, of just dragging their exes into court when there is no real appropriate reason or urgent need for it. My ex-husband shows up and loves his kids and they love him, but he's not religious. He's involved with drugs. I worry that he's a bad influence in their life. He causes them a lot of confusion. How do I protect them? Is any father better than no father? Is there a point where it's better for children to be sheltered and have one derech, even at the expense of being separated from a parent for a period of time? Wow. You're asking me tough questions. It's above my pay grade, man, woman. What should I tell you? This is such a serious dilemma you're asking. Yes, he, he will be. <laughs> this is not an easy influence. But you know what? You know, there's two voices inside of me. One voice says, you know, let's shelter them. Can we get rid of this father and give them one derech? But you have to know if that's really going to work. Is that really going to work? Maybe it's going to cause more damage. Maybe the wiser thing is to be able to create a healthy home and a counter-influence that is so powerful that ultimately our children will grow up with a depth and a maturity and an understanding that they have to make choices and we will hope and pray that they make the right choices. You know, a part of me says that may be long-term much healthier, much more real, and much more authentic. So you have to know the practical possibilities. You have to know the age of your children. But if he's loving them and they're loving him, it's going to be very difficult to tear them away from him. And it's probably not the right thing. So I think what we want to do is you want to remain very connected to your children. You want them to have such a powerful attachment to you so that when they grow up, they feel deeply connected. And you want them to have a good experience of Yiddishkeit in the deepest, deepest, and most real way. And with deep connection, with deep av, with deep dveikas. And then another question is, is there a way, an indirect way that we can help your ex realize that using drugs while educating children is really, really counterproductive and he has to find other ways of numbing and dealing with his pain? Are there people who can influence him? Does he have an older brother? Does he have an uncle who's a sensitive, smart kid, smart man who can help him? I have family in town, but they're not here for me. They never invite my children. They never invite me for Shabbos meals, for Yom Tov. Pesach is coming. I feel sad. They don't understand the struggles I'm going through. How should I deal with this? Great question. My question is, is it possible for you to sit down with one of them or some of them or all of them, one-on-one -on -one or in a group, and really share this with them? I don't know your family, but they may be fine people. They may just be clueless. They may not realize what you're going through. And maybe you could share it with them. There's nothing wrong with asking people for help. You know, we sometimes come from a culture where we're not allowed to ask anybody. If they offer, they can offer. And even when they offer, it's generic. You know, can I help you? Yes, you can go shopping for Shabbos. Yes, you can take the kids off the bus. Yes, you can make dinner for the next three years. <laughs> Tell them what you need. So maybe that's a good way to begin. Can you speak to your sister, to your brother, to your parents, to your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law? They may be fine people. They may just not realize what's going on and say, yes, my kids need to be invited every other night, please. Two things may happen. They may say, oh, we're sorry, we didn't realize, and they may change their ways. Or they may just throw you under the bus. But you know what? That's going to also be an awareness for you. So you'll know that you can't rely on these people and you have to create a new support system. How does one co-parent with an addict who fluctuates erratic behaviors, I feel that I'm enforcing my five-year-old that this is normal. Or this is a very good question. You have to speak to a real expert and a professional about this. How to practically navigate with such a co-parent, I don't feel that I'm entitled to answer this question. I don't have the experience and the knowledge. 
Why is it that from divorces have to be toxic and bitter and messy to the utmost level? Why is it so condoned and normalized in the community? What's being done about this? I agree with you a thousand percent. It's a busha, it's a shanda, it's a cherpa, it's disgusting, it's disgraceful. That Rebetzins, rabbis, Rosh Hashivas, Mashpiyim, Mechanchim, people of means, people of influence, people of affluence, leaders of community, political leaders, social leaders, spiritual leaders, scholars, men and women, do not stand up for the, to this. They allow men or women to get away with abusive, disgusting, repulsive behavior is unforgivable. This is a stain on our community. We have to stand up to abusers. We have to stand up to molesters. We have to stand up to people who exploit their spouses, who manipulate their spouses, who use their children as missiles. We should make it very clear to them that they will not be welcome. We will do whatever we can to stand up to this immoral behavior. Of course, we always want to try to speak peacefully and communicate peacefully and not judge people. It's not about judging people. But this is about loisamoid al dam reyacha. Do not stand idle when your brother's or sister's blood is being spilled. Do not. And if I do stand idle, I am an accomplice to the crime. You just triggered me. <laughs> Sorry. I am a single full-time father. Most questions are about ex-husbands and ex-fathers. But you know there are other cases where the mother and the wife is the sole cause of divorce. The mother is not from. The mother abandoned the children. And by the way, there are a few cases where the wives don't want to return to their husbands. But her strong father and family decided on divorce. They took away the wife and most kids from him, making court cases and of course saying that he's a, he's a Masariv, he's not giving a get, when in reality she longs she is the one who destroyed the marriage. She doesn't want to return to the husband. She longs to get. Not always can you judge by the cover seeing a man not giving a get. I am a single full-time father of a few little children. Yeah, that's why I think most people I'm speaking to are single moms, but I think I tried to emphasize a few times that it works in both directions and we have to stand up for justice wherever it's being done. Sometimes men are abusive and sometimes women can be abusive. <laughs> and sometimes we're both abusive to each other and sometimes we're both wrong and sometimes we're both right, 100 percent. I just have to say that if a woman doesn't want to be with her husband, nobody can force her to be with her husband. <laughs> the Rambam has an expression in Hilchis Ishus, I think chapter 11 or chapter 12, he says, a woman is not a captive in the hands of her husband that if she is disgusted by him and she doesn't like him, there's no such a thing, we force her to stay. If she is not happy, if she's miserable in the marriage, we help her get out of the marriage. So that's very important to understand. Sometimes a husband says, no, I'm going to force her to stay in the marriage. That's why I'm not giving her a get. I'm going to force her to stay in the marriage. That is ludicrous. You are giving yourself more power than God has given himself. God gives people free choice, but you're not going to give people free choice because you know better than them what the right thing is. So it's important to understand if a husband is miserable in a marriage, he could get out of the marriage. And if a woman is miserable in the marriage, she should be able to get out of the marriage. That is normal. That is sane. That is moral. Now, I can try to convince her and convince him and persuade them they should go to therapy, they should work on the marriage. I will try to do that. I do it all the time. <laughs> Not all the time, but I do it a lot of the time. I, we should try to do that. But sometimes it's just not happening. One of them may just not be interested. Too much water came under the bridge. There's too much abuse. Maybe they're making a mistake. But there's a certain point where you have to be able to respect the decisions of another person, even if those decisions have consequences that I don't want. I cannot chain two people and force them to be in a marriage. We, just, we have to respect that. How do I deal with my family? My family has so much animosity towards my ex-husband. They can barely hold their contempt for him back around my children. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a fan of his. But we are careful not to argue or speak negatively about each other in front of the kids. You're a smart lady, and you have to explain this to your siblings and to your parents. Tell your parents, do you love my children more than you hate him? You know what Golden Mayor said, right? Golden Mayor said, peace with the Arabs will come when they love their own children more than they hate our children. I understand you guys have issues with my ex. Trust me, I have more issues than you, mommy, tati. 
my dear brothers and sisters, but I love my children more than I have contempt for my ex, and I need you to know that he is their father. <laughs> he is their father forever, and I want them to be able to respect their father. I want them to be able to have a normal relationship with their father. I want them to be able to have attachment with their father. Please don't ruin it. I have a hard enough life. If you need somebody else to explain this to your family, get somebody else. Get a sensitive, smart rabbi to explain it to your parents. Parenting on my own brings a whole host of challenges. The biggest one for me is I need to be on all the time. I can tap out and have someone else take over when I get emotional or angry. But I don't have anybody. I find myself parenting in a way that I'm unhappy with. How do I deal with my own anger when dealing with my children? I grew up in an angry home. I don't want that for my children. But I have no partner to help me in these situations. I feel completely at a loss. You need to, you need to nurture yourself and you need to work on yourself. The most important thing. We cannot educate our children before we educate ourselves. <laughs> right? Before v'shinantam levanecha is v'haftas Hashem alakecha b'chalavav cholam shcha b'chal maidecha. Education of children is first and foremost self-education. Your children are triggering you. They're reminding you of things that you don't like. And you have to be aware of those things. And you have to work it through in your own system. Maybe you need help. You probably have to meditate every day. You probably need more exercise. You probably need more time with yourself. You probably have to wake up earlier and spend some time with your neshama and your guf. You probably need some treatments that can maybe help you. Maybe various therapies that can help you release the trauma in your body. Because the body holds the score in the famous title. Can you do that work? Maybe somatic, maybe EMDR, maybe other forms of therapy that can help you release a lot of that anger. And I think it's important that when your children are triggering you, instead of getting angry at them, take a deep breath and ask yourself, what are they bringing up for you? What are these kids bringing up for you? Why are they triggering you? Something is happening inside of you. And I think you'll become much more aware. But you're going to need help with this. And I think you also need help in the house. You have to reach out to organizations or to relatives or to family or to babysitters. Maybe you need two hours a day for yourself. Maybe you need four hours a day. Maybe you need to go away one day a week. I don't know. Maybe you need somebody to help you with Shabbos. But you need more time for yourself. My ex and I want to be civil and have peace so we can be here for our children. Our families are so against each other. How do we get them to stop hating each other so violently? You have to set boundaries. You have to talk to your family and say, listen, we have kids to raise. You hating him or hating her is very nice, but it's selfish. So either you help us if you want to be here for us, and if not, you have to create strong boundaries so it shouldn't affect you guys. Father has so many emotional challenges, sometimes emotionally present, sometimes absent, sometimes abusive. How do I balance relaying to them that he loves you and not equating that, that that's acceptable relationship of love and that this is the right relationship down the line? <clears throat> this also needs a professional expert. It's a tough one because you want them to be close to their father, but you want them to realize that their father may have emotional or mental illness. That's a tough one. How do, you, how, do you, how do you talk to your children about a husband's or ex-husband's mental illness or emotional deep flaws? Very good question. Speak to a professional who deals with this about this. How do I balance being in court with a vile attorney, seemingly biased judge, and keeping the proper perspective of betachen? Oh, it's hard. It's hard, it's hard. Yeah. I think in the morning you have to say brachas and daven with a lot of kavana and really anchor yourself and trust in Hashem that He's with you and He's holding your hand and He's going to get you through this. And of course, Al Piteva, you need to find the best people to help you. How can I, as a father, properly understand my daughter and what she's going through and care for her? 
I sometimes feel that since I didn't grow up in the same situation that she will grow up in, I can never really understand what she's going through. I understand that many people give advice to constantly just plan, to constantly just be there with love, which I do, and she loves spending her time with me. But what more can I do to properly understand and feel her and then give in return? First of all, I admire the question. I admire the question very much, and I think the best answer for this is to just listen to her. Just show up and listen to her. Just listen. And when you listen to her, you'll figure out and you'll know a lot. And do fun things with her. Could you go on hikes? Can you go shopping together? Can you go for pizza, for ice cream? Can you play board games together? Can you play ball together? Can you play some other things together? Learn together, study together, explore things together. I don't know. Watch something educational, Jewish, inspiring together and have conversations about it. Go horseback riding together. Whatever it is, you know, build a snowman together. It's probably more apropos for these days in Muncie. But I think in all of that, you will hear a lot. You will hear a lot. And, and the more you listen, the more you hear. And the more you hear, the more you'll understand and appreciate. Okay, Reb Levy, you want to uh, conclude the evening? Absolutely. Okay, very good. I'm just going to thank my extended family for giving me the privilege of addressing you and thank all the single moms who have graced us here this evening, all the single dads who have graced us here this evening, anybody else who has graced us here this evening, our family, friends, or relatives, and bless all of you that Hashem should give you the strength, the kayach, and the chizuk to be able to endure what you're going through, to be able to have the courage and the dignity to navigate your journeys with unwavering confidence, joy, and an inner sense of peace and serenity, and to be able to bring light into your lives, into your homes, and to realize that each of you is an ambassador of God, an ambassador of infinity, an ambassador of love, light, hope, healing, authenticity, and redemption, and to be able to do it with a lot of hatzlocha and a lot of nachas, health, happiness, and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.